tell me, brother, what were you the god of again? Today we've got a very special guest, a guest with the sharpest screen in the business, some of the best audio on offer, the only cameras with a DSLR style control system, and a headphone jack. Fasten your seatbelts because today we are pushing the limits to find out what the Xperia 1 Mark II is all about. Starting off with the design, like most modern flagships it's got a metal frame sandwiched in glass, which means the front and back are quite shiny and the sides have a shimmer to them as well. Unlike most smartphones, it's quite long, therefore it's much easier to hold. However, we can't get around the fact that it's just flat out huge. Just for reference, it's as tall as a Note 20 Ultra. It's also got some weight to it, but if you've seen my previous videos, you'd notice that I like my tech on the heavier side, so it's down to preference here. On the back, it's got a rather peculiar finish. At first it looks like a mirror finish, until you change the angle of the lighting and then you realise it's actually purple. You can also get it in black and green, purple just stood out to me the most. Flip it over and you've got a very satisfying 21x9 display, with no notch or punch hole, which means Sony could fit some meaty speakers on the top and bottom for very balanced audio, which we'll get to later. On the sides, Sony continues to add some of their unique finishing touches. For example, a side-mounted fingerprint scanner that's also a power button, and a dedicated shutter button for taking pictures, which has a really satisfying half-press for focusing. Moving on to the other side, you've got a SIM tray which normally isn't much to be excited about, but this one opens without the shiny pokey tool, and it's still IP68 water and dust resistant. Also, you've got space for a micro SD card of up to 1 terabyte. We cannot proceed any further without talking about that display. It's a 6.5 inch 4K OLED panel with 643 pixels per inch, which means it's officially the sharpest screen on a modern smartphone. Plus it's an OLED, so you're getting ridiculously punchy colours with deep blacks. It's like holding a Sony TV in your hands. I have to mention however, it's not the brightest screen, but it does get properly dim, so it's not very good for use in broad daylight but it's really good for scrolling memes at night. Coming back to that pixel density and resolution, going all the way up to 4K makes this screen a cut above the rest. I'll admit on its own you may not be able to tell it's 4K exactly, but against a 1080p panel with around 408 pixels per inch, the difference becomes a little clearer. When you have such a jump in resolution, you gain much more than just sharper details. You also get an increase in vibrance and dynamic range, so you see a lot more tones and hues. So if you are upgrading from a 2-3 to three year old phone, you will definitely feel the jump. The science behind it is pretty fascinating as well. Taking a very basic example, say we have a colour change from red to yellow. On this 1080p panel, we have 4 pixels to do that in, so the colour change is pretty sudden. The top 2 are red, and the bottom 2 are yellow. Now if we increase the resolution by 4 times, we have more pixels available which means we can fit in a few shades of orange to really flesh out that colour change. And this process is done over thousands of pixels which results in the overall lift in vibrance. Sony takes it a step further by giving you two really cool settings. The first is creator mode. This enables you to watch movies in the exact colour settings that the director intended. A lot of new smartphones tend to oversaturate movie and TV content because they're always trying to show bright and vivid colours, so this setting gives you a more authentic viewing experience. The second setting is adjustable white balance. Along with the vast amount of controls for colour temperature, you can also change it to your printer setting so you can see an accurate preview of what a printed picture will look like. A nifty trick for photographers and illustrators. So we've got a very colour accurate, pin sharp, ultra wide screen. But what's the point of all of that? 
For general daily use, the ultrawide aspect ratio means you can fit in a lot more content when you're texting, which means less screenshots when you've got some serious beef. Also on social media, you can fit in more tweets and more pictures, especially pictures. Instagram pictures look quite a bit sharper and livelier on the screen compared to most older screens. Moving on to entertainment, there's a lot of ultrawide content on offer. For starters, you've got pretty much every movie ever, plenty of TV shows, and a lot of music videos. Most Western pop, K-pop, Bollywood, and J-Metal are all shot in ultrawide, and the first three are also available in 4K. So if you're a diehard fan of any of these industries, or if you watch a ton of movies or TV shows, then this is the phone for you. Actually, let's not jump to that conclusion yet. What about the speakers? The sound from these speakers is impressively clear, and when you turn up the volume, the quality doesn't deteriorate either. Vocals and percussion especially shine through, and because each speaker is equally sized, you get very balanced, clear, and loud audio, and oh boy do they get loud. For this audio test, I've got this speaker at 50% volume, and this phone at 80% volume. Let's see how loud it really gets. I'm too bad, how you do that? Don't ask them questions there, cause the rappers these on 10. Oh my god! How you stop and start in my own music? You pause it, I. Name Lulus, Chuma Jada, I'm too bad, how you do that? Don't ask them questions there, cause the rappers these on 10. Oh my god! How you stop and start in my own music? You pause it, I lose it. You might notice a lack of bass, which makes the sound somewhat lightweight. To compensate for that, there's an option called dynamic vibration which makes the phone vibrate to make up for the lost bass. When you're holding your phone, it is a bit irritating, but I found that if you put it on a flat surface and set the dynamic vibration to around 50%, it actually improves the sound. Plus, if you want further control, you can head into the Dolby Atmos settings and play around with a variety of controls. So, it's shaping up to be an absolute champion for media consumption, and the top-notch hardware continues with the internals. On board, we have the Snapdragon 865, paired with 8 gigs of RAM. Given that it was the fastest processor at the time, it can handle just about anything you throw at it. Which includes 4K gaming. With the PSP emulator, you can crank the resolution all the way up and it will run perfectly. Even with graphic intense games like Final Fantasy Dissidia, you won't get a single stutter and the upscaled graphics make a world of difference. Pair this with a compatible gamepad and you've got yourself a 4K PSP. I'll be making another video comparing this gamepad to an actual PSP, so make sure you're subscribed for that. Regular Android games make even better use of the screen, as they extend all the way across to make full use of that ultrawide display. Add in the vibrant colours and mega sharp details, and you've got a proper mobile gaming beast. Coming to the cameras, this is a crucial point of any smartphone review, especially high-end flagships. Sony's taken a wildly different approach to the rest of the industry, and that's mostly a good thing. On board, we have a main wide, a telephoto, and an ultra-wide angle lens, all at 12 megapixels. You've also got a 3D time of flight sensor, which assists with focusing and improves depth perception. Most shots from the main sensor come out quite detailed, and the colours are kept pretty natural, which you may or may not like. I normally use it for food and landscapes, and they turn out just fine. If you're in well-lit scenarios, your photos turn out slightly better. The telephoto lens has great detail and more importantly, very impressive depth of field. For this shot, I didn't even need to turn on portrait mode. Sometimes, your shots can turn out to be quite dull, but a quick fix can edit that easily. The ultrawide, on the other hand, delivers remarkably sharp pictures with very rich colours. For the camera software itself, other than a portrait mode and panorama, you don't get anything else in terms of photography. And that's not bad news at all. Earlier when I said Sony took a different approach, here's what I meant. Instead of baking in a load of automatic algorithms, like night mode and AI super zoom, they've stuck to their guns. 
and given you a separate camera app with DSLR-style controls called Photo Pro. Inspired by their class-leading mirrorless cameras, this app gives you a near-identical interface to a professional camera, where you can control so many parameters, such as the shutter speed, ISO, exposure, metering mode, and you've even got a histogram and level indicator. Plus, they've also got eye autofocus on the main and ultra-wide lens, another glorious feature from the Alpha cameras. This basically means that you can crank up the shutter speed and freeze objects in motion, perfect for capturing wildlife as it keeps the duck and the water in focus and manages to capture all the details. Recently it was snowing heavily and I managed to freeze those moments as well. To sweeten the deal further, you can now capture raw shots in all three lenses. This means you have more freedom to edit the image without breaking it. So you can take this picture and turn it into this. Alternatively, you can slow it right down and take in all the light available, so in essence you do have a night mode. I'll admit it's a lot of jargon to take in if you're new to photography, but this is one of the best ways to learn on a phone. I mean, before anything else, I'd recommend getting a DSLR if you want to take up photography, but if you're upgrading your phone anyway, then this is definitely something to consider. With video, there's also two programs to choose from. With the main app, you can record up to 4K at 30fps. You've got the usual stabilization features in HDR, but you've also got this intelligent wind filter, which blocks out that annoying wind sound. So this is with the wind filter off. Just trying to get all the noise. Turn the wind filter on, this is what it sounds like. Works pretty well. So uh, this is the video um, using the main sensor and we've got HDR turned on. It's quite a cloudy day but um, it's still giving a good dynamic range I'd say. To get that high dynamic range, sometimes it darkens things a bit too much. Uh, it depends on your taste and it's easily recoverable in video editing, so it's not too much of a deal breaker. Saturation's really good. Uh, I feel like um, colors could pop a bit more. It's got pretty good detail. Now if you turn the HDR off, you get a much brighter image. Uh, colors are popping a lot more, uh, much more saturation in there. And I think I actually prefer this one. Um, you've got stabilization as well. And um, it's looking pretty good. The one thing I would say is right now through the viewfinder, everything's a bit shaky. So what you get through the viewfinder and what you get in the end result, it's quite different. But uh, yeah, HDR turned off and the colors improve. So it's a trade-off between colors and detail. It's, it's up to you uh, which one uh, you prefer. Now we're zooming in three times with the telephoto lens and um, with HDR turned off it's got really good depth actually. Uh, the colours are there as well, nice and punchy. It does end up changing the white balance sometimes noticeably but it's pretty good. Uh, you've got stabilisation as well, it's a pretty good video from the telephoto lens. It does have trouble focusing sometimes but... Turning on HDR doesn't dampen the colours so much, although I really, I much prefer HDR turned off than on. Now we've got the ultra wide angle lens, got really good coverage, it's got great contrast as well actually. This is with the HDR turned on, so um, colours aren't exactly popping. This is with uh, HDR off, so the colours are popping quite a bit. It's not oversaturated, it's quite realistic colours I'd say. That can be a good thing or a bad thing depending on what you're going for. Yeah, stabilisation is good. You can get really up close to objects actually, it doesn't lose its focus. It's got really good depth field as well. And you can get quite close to objects. Another thing with the video is the autofocus is really good, it kicks in pretty quickly. and you've got really good depth because the main sensor is actually quite big. So you really do get that sort of professional blur, even if you're not that close to the object at all. And the blur is quite punchy. It's really good separation. 
now coming to Cinema Pro, an app dedicating to filming proper ultrawide movies. Here you can shoot in 4K at up to 60 FPS, along with all the professional controls such as ISO, shutter speed and colour presets. Here's my own short movie to demonstrate what it's capable of. Now we get to the software. It's pretty much stock Android with a few Sony touches like Sight Sense. Two taps on either side of the screen brings up this little menu to launch apps quickly, open multitasking and one-handed mode, which you'll need quite often because, well, it's a big boy. The multitasking is probably the best I've ever used. It has this nifty feature where you can open a carousel of apps for the top and bottom to quickly switch between them, and you can preload a set of past combinations as well. It came with Android 10, but I got the Android 11 update two days ago. For the most part, it's buttery smooth with absolutely no bloatware at all. In fact, while cutting down on software, Sony's cut a bit too far and removed their own gallery. So you're left with Google Photos, and I'm really not a fan. If you've just received the chance to update, I'd say hold off for now. With the new update, it's kind of buggy. The camera takes ages to load, and Snapchat just refuses to load. And they've added this weird thing where they tell you what type of notifications you have. It's so unnecessary. I can read. I know what a conversation is. I won't mistake it for a regular update. On the whole, I'm very happy that a phone like this exists. The fact that you can get something with such obscure dimensions and insanely high, borderline unnecessary specs. It has a wow factor that was missing from a lot of smartphones last year, especially when they all looked like this. Plus, it's got some unique finishing touches to remind you that it's a media-focused device, such as the shutter button and the Photo Pro app. It's just Sony doing Sony things, and I absolutely love it. Even if you don't want to tinker around, if you're just getting bored of your current phone and you want something new and exciting, then this is definitely something to consider. On a single charge, I got about six and a half hours of screen on time. Half an hour of that was PSP emulation at 4K, and another entire hour was spent on YouTube. So for normal use cases, you'll definitely get more out of it. Although, if you do take pictures for Insta and Twitter and you don't really want to think about editing them, or if you don't really watch that much content on your phone, and you actually like your current smartphone brand, then considering it's £700, I'd say you might be getting more for your money elsewhere. But if you're a massive tech enthusiast like me and just love to crank up every setting to the max, and just find out what's the most you can do on a smartphone, then there's no better device out there for you than the Xperia 1 Mark II. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to stay tuned for more stuff like this. For now, let's me out and I'll see you later.